Hello, everyone. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me fine. It uh, looks like you can. Uh, this is thank you for joining us today for our specially crop integrated pest management webinar series part three. Uh, again, my name is Amy Kohler. I am the specialty crop instructor and technician here at Dakota College of Botno. And today we're going to be talking about integrated pest management, scouting and monitoring. Um, a big part as we get through this um, the lecture today and some of the slides of uh, scouting and monitoring is one of the really big parts and a really critical part of a great um, efficient integrated pest management uh, system set up for your specialty crop production. So we're going to go through a little bit of some of the tools and the methods in scouting and monitoring uh, and some things that maybe you didn't know, some things you might not might have known. Um, and like we've, I think a lot of things to do, especially crops, we'll talk about the importance of records and recording and keeping track of things from year to year over time. So we'll, uh, looks like every looks like it is about time. So we'll get started. So just to remind everybody. Um, this is a, this, when I talk about scouting and monitoring, we're going back to integrated pest management and remembering that integrated pest management is a sustainable approach to managing pests by usually combining biological, cultural, physical, and chemical tools in a way that minimizes economic risk, health, and environmental risks. And so, and the part of that, so, and what really the only way you can really know when it's the right time to apply these different types of controls is knowing when you have a pest problem. And the earlier you can identify and approach those pest issues, the more efficient you will be in your control methods. So today we're gonna to go through a few of those. And then starting on next week, Tuesday, we'll actually go through the management side of things. We'll talk about those biological and cultural and physical and chemical tools um, that can be utilized with integrated pest management uh, towards the different pests that we discussed about last week. And hopefully that will kind of conclude the rest of our, um, our webinar series. But let's getting back into scouting and monitoring. Uh, so like I said before, so regular, the cornerstone of any integrated pest management program is regular scouting in, of the crop at hand, depending on whatever crop that you might have. Um, and it's always important that scouting and monitoring practices are done systematically and at regular intervals. So there is a method to the madness um, when you're doing scouting and, and monitoring. And the biggest thing is if you're just going to randomly look at stuff here and there when you can remember, yeah, you might, you might catch something, you might find something before there's an issue, but more than likely you're, you're, you're going to miss more things than you actually are going to find. But if you can develop a system that is consistent and you can keep doing that at a regular interval, build that into your daily or weekly tasks with your specialty crop production, you're going to be really efficient in identifying and monitoring those pest issues you might have arise and hopefully be able to address any issues before they become so out of hand that your only your last option or only option is to use more of that chemical control, which tends to be more on the toxic side and have a few more um, human health and environmental risks as well. And that's one of the biggest parts of integrated pest management is making this a sustainable way of dealing with pests. And as we discussed in the first week, using chemical methods, though it can be very effective at times, um, isn't exactly a sustainable way to deal with pests in a long-term um, strategy. So it's always really important when it comes to besides having regular intervals and things like that, it's also important to for your scouting program effective is you should be familiar with what a crop should look like. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, you know, know what a healthy crop is. So you know when to identify when there's issues. Hopefully, you know, if you're familiar with the crop, that may not be an issue, but maybe you're trying out a new, you know, a new type of cultivar you haven't tried before and so you're not as familiar with what a fat crop should look like really healthy so it might be as simple as doing a little research on that um, and then also you know know what you're looking for you should ha uh, it's always great to have on hand a key to pests there's a lot of great field guides out there to help you kind of identify i know we went through a few last week of some more popular ones but i can tell you right now you'll probably eventually get a pet you could be doing you put especially crop production for 10 plus years and you'll 
months and you might still find that one pest, that one season that you've never, or disease that you've never seen before and you're just not sure what it is. So it's always good to have a couple of resources to deal with those, to look those up. And we'll talk about that as well as some local resources here in North Dakota you can use. Um, but there are also some really great field guides out there. There's even some apps we'll talk about. Um, I'm not very familiar with some of the pest identification apps, and there's always the issue of depending on where those, you know, those apps are based out of, because, you know, every region is different in the United States. But there are, the great thing about this digital age and our global age is there are a lot of really great online keys, and then there's also some other resources through your local extensions as well to help you identify your pest issues. So, like I said, um, a big part of scouting and monitoring is knowing uh, what you're looking for and also knowing the signs and that damage um, that can help you lead to figuring out what pest it is. Um, so, but remember, at the end of the day, though, the faster your pest problems identify, the more efficiently you can manage it. So why is scouting so important? And we've kind of talked about that a little bit, but to kind of get into more details, um, one of the reasons is kind of going back to what we talked about in the first week with that economic threshold. You know, each producer needs to set for each crop that they have, it's really efficient to set a level of predation or damage that you're willing to have with whatever pest or disease you might have with that crop that um, you're willing to put up with before you're willing to put more energy or resources into dealing with that pest. And it's going to be different for everybody. You mean for you as a producer, it might be you're not willing to deal with any damage. You do not want to lose even 1% of your crop. And fixing that or addressing that pest issue is, you know, is very, very important to you and you want to do it right away. That's awesome. But maybe you have all, you grow a lot of tomatoes and if it's not been, it's going to cost you more to try to fix your your pest problem then we'll lose maybe five percent of your sellable tomatoes you know that's something each producer needs to set for themselves but when you're setting those economic thresholds we talked about last in the first week oh, you need to have a quantifying way to address that issue so you can't just say well i feel like this is a good time which you could but to be really efficient you should you know if you set that 40 percent of my crop is affected it's a time where i'm going to actually start doing applying different managing methods, then you need a way to know when you've reached that 40%. And that's part of the scouting and monitoring is quantifying that potential damage that that pest could be allowing. And it allows you to address the problem in a way that you, um, your managed strategies are the most effective. If you can keep track and know exactly when your that pest level has reached that economic threshold or that threshold that you're willing you're no longer willing to just sit by and monitor and actually apply some management controls or something along those lines. Scouting and monitoring on a regular, consistent basis will allow that for you. And then also, when you scout and monitor, it will help you determine what insects and pests have become active or have arrived. So, uh, especially if you don't, you know, if you've been doing this for many years, you might have a really great idea of when certain pests come around or when to start looking for them. So maybe you wanna keep track of that over the years to know, you know, to have a better idea. Of, I, I know by May 15th or June 3rd that I should start looking for flea beetles because my records have shown that over the years, I've always had flea beetles on my coal crops between these two dates. Um, and that's kind of, if you can do consistent monitoring and scouting and also record that data from year to year, you'll have a better time to know when you even look for when those pest issues might come about. And then of course, like anytime, especially with disease, um, or even pests, it's always really um, important to detect as early as possible because certain diseases and pests out there that when, if you can detect them before the physical signs are so evident that you wouldn't need to do regular scouting to see it, you might, you're gonna have a lot better success in dealing with that. A really good example is spider mites in a high tunnel situation. Um, spider mites are teeny tiny little pests that you, if you're not, if you're not regularly inspecting for them, by the time you would visually see it just by your everyday activities where they're really causing damage, I, I hate to say it, at that point it's almost moot because I, they're really hard to control once they get to a certain level of population and that usually coincides with that really physical visual damage that they create. Whereas if you can identify that you have spider mates before their population really gets out of hand that you would actually need to look for them to find them, it's going to be much easier to control them and keep their population in a level that, you know, a level that's maintainable. 
And then last but not least, which is probably one of the most important things, is it will increase your chance um, that you'll notice the problems before they get out of control, which kind of goes back to the scouting for critical damage and things like that. But again, the earlier you can, you can approach or identify that you have a pest issue, you're going to be able to handle it better and you're going to be able to know when you're going to be the most successful in managing that pest issue. So, and you'll notice that a lot of these things we talked about have to do with records. Um, I know as producers, a lot of times we keep a lot of records. You have records on your marketing, records on your sales, your expenses, uh, and then pre-planting and grow, you know, harvest dates and things like that. But you probably should also be keeping records of your pest issues or your pest management practices and your scouting and your monitoring. That's all kind of can be kept in one, you know, one set of records. Um, because it's going to allow you to also remember when you have peasant present problems. Sometimes if you have a really large popular, uh, really large production or a very diverse production, you might forget, yeah, I did see a, I did see that spider mite or I did see a potato bug, you know, just one the other day, but I can't remember where I saw it, which part of my field did I see it. If you have a record that you've been keeping track of with your consistent pest monitoring, you can go back and you don't have to rely. I mean, I know I have a hard time sometimes remembering where I put my shoes in on in the morning, let alone, you know, which part of my, of my lettuce crop did I notice there were aphids or which um, variety of, tomato, of onions that I had that might have, I might have noticed a few thrips or something along that lines. And then on a long scale or a, a longer period of time, is what we talked about earlier, is those yearly pest patterns. If you have multiple years of your pest records and knowing what, not only knowing when the pests show up, but also keeping track of the management practices that you applied, um, and what worked and what may not have will help you just build and do even do a little more prep each year to make your integrated pest management um, program that more successful as time goes on and know when to start looking and really scouting for certain pest issues that you've had in the past. And then again, from that large scale, looking back, you know, it's sometimes hard to see things or make connections when you're really up and close with your, um, with your production. But, you know, stepping back after a few months and saying, hey, I noticed that I had a, big, a bigger spider mite issue when right after we had a lot of raining. We'll talk about keeping track of environmental factors. Um, things you may not have noticed or put together um, while things are actually happening because we're so busy busy trying to get things harvested and planted and needed um, that when you do have time to sit back and try to make some connections between your pest issues and your production and varieties, you'll have those records to look back at to remind yourself and make those connections. So some really, there's a lot of really great examples of scouting sheets out there and you can, you know, create your own or there are lots of different extension areas that have their own. This sheet here is one that I modified from Michigan State University that we use uh, for our specialty crop block grants with um, some of the, the the producers we used in our project with trying to identify and develop some new integrated pest management practices here in North Dakota. So it's really simple. You know, you a lot of times when you're doing keeping records, you're going to probably want to go by crop um, because it's just easier to go back. So this year it's it's crop, the date, who scouted. We'll talk about the importance of if you have mul if you might have some people working for you or if you're a two man job. Sometimes having the same person scout is a better practice than having multiple scout because everyone does it a little bit differently. And you know, when it comes to keeping track information and being efficient, you want to keep things consistent. So it's a bit easier to keep track who's scouting what. Um, your location, so that's going to help you remember where you're going to be. And then also stages, because remember, certain pests tend to have more damage or tend to affect different crops differently at different stages of that crop's life. A really good example um, is the potato beetle and the potato plant. Um, there is a point um, that a potato, once a potato plant gets to a certain point in its life stage, that you could pretty much have all of the foliage on top of that plant completely eaten up by potato beetles, but it's not really, a, if it's, the plant's far enough along that it's not going to affect your potatoes underground. So is, if you're past that point in the crop stage, is it really worth trying to address your potato bug issue besides maybe trying to, you know, alleviate stress for next year? 
um, because your crop at the end of the day is still going to be the same. You know, that's something you'll have to decide, but crop stage would play a role in that. Um, and then, of course, along here you'll see is the date. Um, we have, you know, your possess, your pest disease disorder. If you don't know what the pest is, this is a great spot to put in what kind of damage you're noticing. Um, you know, and some reminders later when you're trying to look up and figure out what that pest is. And then how did you scout? Um, how did you measure it? Did you measure, I, you know, I saw 10 potato bugs per plant or I saw five plants that were 20% were defoliated. Um, this is kind of something just trying to help remind you and kind of quantify how you're going to scout or, you know, record what that pest issue is and how it's affecting it. Um, and then a summary, you know, it could be just, again, reminders of how 40% affected, or is it 25 bugs, or I noticed, you know, any kind of thing with kind of bringing that down. And this one I liked because it taught you, you already have your threshold here. So if your summary is 40% affected and your threshold is 50%, then you know you're getting close. Or if it's only 10% were affected by whatever pest it was and your threshold is only 60, I mean, that's, again, it's, pretty, you know, it's where you make it your own. Um, you'll have that reminder to like, what is my threshold? And then it even gives you some space for some management practices. What action did you apply and did it work or not? And that's kind of for your long-term record. So this is really, I really liked using this as some your scouting report records, but here's just some other simple ones. It can be really simple. I know when we're busy in the field, we don't mean to have a lot of time to write everything. This is one, I believe, Again, it's from machine state, but it's more towards a greenhouse setting. So it could be utilized in a high tunnel or something like that. You know, dates and the location of the greenhouse or the high tunnel, the crop, the pests that you see, anything you might have done. Um, we'll talk about sticky cards and ways of counting. Sometimes people will quantify or create a threshold by their traps to know, like, I'm going to, you know, apply some type of control not on how many of my plants that are affected but the actual population of the pests so you can use traps to keep track of that population and then any of the control or environmental things and then notes as well and then and they have this other one over here it's a bit more depth and a little bit of a different way to do it um but you know there's a lot of examples out there or you can always create something for yourself it's one of those great idea great ideas to create records that work for you and maybe we'll tie into any other records that you have uh, but like I said, there's lots of great uh, resources and examples and probably sheets that you could download online as well. So going back to the actual scouting and, and monitoring, the act of scouting and monitoring, before you get started, like I said before, the most important thing is to know what a healthy plant looks like because and it's not just what it looks like above ground. You want to know what that healthy plant looks like, you know, when it's growing. You want to know what the healthy roots look like and you also want to know what does the healthy plant maybe what side inside of the fruit looks like or the stem or the leaf really understand and get to know the crop that you have and because if you know that plants help like we did, i talked before a happy healthy plant a happy plant is a healthy plant um and so the, you can know that you're maintaining a healthy plant you know you're at one you're going to be able to better fight off any diseases or pests that might become present but also you if you know what that healthy plant should look like you'll notice that much faster when you might uh, the early signs or symptoms of whatever pest or disease you might be having um you know and one of the examples is you know a sick plant is less productive and also will give some very subtle indicators such as color and growth. You know, those are your symptoms. Uh, and then also you wanna know what a healthy plant looks like so you can recognize when there's a problem um, and hopefully as early as possible. And so once you know what a healthy, happy plant looks like, um, you wanna start looking for those symptoms. And usually there's two approaches you should utilize when looking for those symptoms. Um, and so you're gonna you're gonna look at the big picture, which is your field, your plot, the garden level stuff that you uh, you're gonna look at the you know, at a more of a back from not so close in on the plant itself, but kind of from a, from a distance. Really try to notice notice different things, and then you're gonna look at the little picture at the at the lower level, and that's the plant level itself, each individual plant or each individual parts of that plant. And once you do those, look at both those levels um, in your scouting, then you would re record that information. So this is a good a great example of a tomato field. This would be your 
big picture where you're looking down the row and you're noticing there's some brown areas over here. I have this first part it's completely having it. Hopefully by this point, um, this is a little bit of an extreme. Hopefully you've noticed there's issues before it gets to this point. This is a pretty dead uh, indicator. There is something going on here that's not right. But um, on the plant level, you know, you might only have a few different, you know, certain plants, you know, look at that each, look at individual plants and different parts of that plant. And we'll talk about that a little more when we get into more detail. So when you're looking at the big picture or your field or plot, um, you want to look at some, you want to look for patterns. Patterns are really, really important because patterns can start giving you early indicators of there might be an issue and then also what that kind of issue might be. Um, you know, is the problem a scan? Is, is, are you noticing some type of problem that's scattered randomly through the field or is it occurring in a pattern? Um, is the problem more prevalent along a fence or a field edge or is it at the entrance of your field or along maybe a waterway? Um, because making those connections and figuring out is it a pest, is it the lay of the land, is it a soil uh, or water nutrition deficiency, something like that. Um, and the more, if the problem is an affected area, more severe in certain soil types of low areas, exposed areas, you really want to kind of look at that big picture to try to figure out what might, could be causing your issue, would be it a pest or something else. Um, and then also does that pattern correspond with tillage, planting, spraying, harvesting, or any other field activities? Because you want to make sure when you're looking for a pest or trying to identify a pest, you want to rule out any other things that it could be, be it, um, you know, human error or, you know, a nutrition deficiency or slope or environmental um, have be it. But, you know, you want to really look around and, and get a feel of your, your garden area, your growth area, look for your high points, your low points, know a bit of your soil or topography, because if you know, hey, that corner of my garden is really, really clay. Um, and so if I'm noticing smaller compact plants or more drought looking issues, or something along those lines, I can say, okay, it might be a pest issue, but it could also be because I know I have some soil issues over there, it could be that. Um, so yeah, you can always make, keep in mind when you're looking for patterns, um, you know, they're gonna help you diagnose your problem. You just really need to look, is it a random pattern or is it something that has, is something that's ha aggregated or it's happening in a way that's that doesn't look so random. And so a good example, I know these are probably corn and soybean fields, um, but on a large scale, it's easier to show you than on a smaller scale. So you'll notice here on the, oh, it'd be your guys' left, is more of a random pattern. So there's patches here and over there and over here and over here in the field. It's very random. There's no rhyme or reason, whereas an aggregated pattern, you're going to see um, patches that are a bit you're going to have you're going to have issues that are patched together so in this one you only only have in this whole little field here there's only two spots where you're noticing issues and they're patched together that would be an aggregated pattern um and sometimes you know random patterns are typically associated with foliar disease it's not always whereas your aggregated patterns would be more associated with soil borne diseases or pathogens or even maybe more of a, a pest issue depending on what type of pest it is. Um, other types of patterns when you're looking at, if you, if you notice you have an aggregated pattern, um, you might want to look at how they're aggregated, what and what likely could be causing them. Again, this is not your traditional specialty crop production. I believe it's a corn and soybean field, but it's a really good representation. Um, on the left, you have a pattern that's associated with the slope. So you'll notice it could be nutrient loss or topsoil erosion, so it's probably not a pest issue. Whereas on the right, um, it's uh, adjacent to a field, and so it could be actually indicating if you have a pathogen or an insect that's along the edge. You don't notice anything about the topography that could be causing that. Um, so you definitely want to look at for the different types of patterns, even if they are aggregated versus random. So once you're looking at the big level and you're noticing there's an issue, um, and you may not know this, there's that's one other thing is you're not always going to see the patterns or the, the, the um, symptoms at that large scale field garden area. And honestly, you wanna to try to identify them before it gets to that point because if you're seeing it at the large scale, 
um, it means it might be almost too late, but it's still a good thing to look at first because it's going to give you your easiest signs of indicators of issues. But what you're really going the next level, which is at the plant level, that's where you're really going to start noticing those issues and really need to be looking and have a regular monitoring or scouting method to notice these these pest issues as early as possible and you're going to see them first at the plant level um, if you're going to be the most efficient at dealing with them. So you want to check individual plants for symptoms and signs. You know, look at the little picture. Uh, you know, you want to make sure you want to compare damaged plants with healthy plants, check the entire plant. That's also really important. You know, just walking through and looking at the top of your plants is not always going to be an indicator that you have a pest issue. A lot of insects tend to be on the undersides of leaves and certain insects will maybe only will affect your roots or your stems or your leaves or even the fruit and certain diseases are the same way. So you can't just always go by checking just the just a one certain part of the plant. You want to check multiple parts of the plant. And then also and we'll talk a bit more about this um, when we talk about some of the tools you might need is you know have a lot of our pest issues you're not, especially on the insect side of things are too small even for you to notice until the damage gets pretty bad. So having some simple tools like hands lens or a pocket knife or a trawl um, and field guides available to you are always very important as well. And so this is a really great example of checking those individual plants and checking all those different parts. Um, these, all these pictures are of diseases that can occur on different parts of an individual plant. So this is a cucumber. So I'm seeing a disease on some leaves. We have some stems and stalks. Uh, this is the actual, you know, there's something going on with some actual fruit. And then there's the large scale of the plant. So it's, and you doesn't, and sometimes you might have all of these indicators. Sometimes you might only have one of these indicators. So if I'm only looking at the, the leaves itself on that, my cucumber, and not really looking too strongly at the stalks, and a lot of the pests and diseases and things like that tend to end, start at the bottom of the plant also, um, I may miss an important symptom that uh, I, if I had caught earlier could have really prevented some, some issues down the road. So um, when you actually have your scouting, uh, your scouting tools and your scouting methods, and I'll talk a little bit about how you might want to time out and when we talk about scouting um, strategies, but some really essential tools that maybe you might always want to have on hand is one, a hand lens. Hand lenses are so important, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about them um, for inspecting small insects and mites and insects, legs, and even feeding damage. Uh, a tally counter. Um, we'll talk about some different options to keep insect counts accurate because, you know, remember when you can quantify the pest damage, you can help, you can be more efficient at making sure you're preventing that economic threshold from being re reached and things like that. Um, and then traps are always, there's lots of different various forms of traps we'll talk about that you can utilize. Um, you know, some may lure the insect, some might trap the insect, some might just trap it. Uh, flags for marking problem areas, because I can tell you, if you see a pest issue, but you want to monitor, it's a lot easier to find it again the next day if you have a nice flag post out there. Um, and then some type of camera, it's a great thing of smartphones, this day and age of smartphones is, you know, you don't have to have a lot of crazy cool equipment. If you've got your smartphone out there with you, um, it's a great way to take some quality pictures of the pests you have, and we'll talk about why that can be really important. A sweep net for collecting insects from foliage. We'll talk more about that. And then a diagram of your fields. Um, and that can be made by hand or graphing, some kind of physical representation of your full garden production that you can look at and help you write you comments or reminders or even part of your flagging. Um, it's always great to have on hand. And then your crop test scouting sheets for that data collection, the record collection that we were talking about. So with your hands lens, um, these here are some, they're, they're easy to find. It can be your little magnifying readers. Um, anything up to about, you're gonna probably want something up to at least 10 magnifiers. Anything more could really help with like spider mites, but you're gonna need something at least probably 10X, if not up, I would suggest up to 20 or 30 if you can find it. Um, X because they really, really are some small pest spider mites are a really good example that they're hard to see with the naked eye. And also when you're trying to identify that pest, there's different pests that for different types of cultivars. So if maybe you know you have a, 
a spider mite, but you want to know what type of spider mite, figure out a better management strategy, be able to see it at a closer, clearer picture will help you identify that. And then your small tally counters. Um, again, these clickers are really easy to find like on Amazon, sometimes grocery hardware stores and things like that. Or if you have a smartphone, you know, you don't actually have to have that clicker. I know the less things I have to carry out into the garden, the better. Um, you know, most phones, iPhone, Android, whatever, you can download the clicker app just to help you keep track. Because I know I get lost and I forget things and all that great stuff. It's great just to kind of like click, click, click every, and then sometimes when I'm doing my scouting, Say I'm looking for potato beetles on my on my uh, eggplants. I just every time I see it, I see a potato bug or a uh, larva or anything. I just make a click, and then that's how I'm going to quantify my economic threshold. Is when I have uh, one row, I have 20 potato beetles or something along those lines. It's all about how you want to quantify keeping track and reaching those economic thresholds. And then your traps. There are a lot of different traps. I'll go over a little bit later. Um, about some of the different uh, uh, traps, but really simple ones, sticky cards, um, yellow versus blue. Yellow, I like the sticky cards that have the little squares in it because sometimes it can help you say if you're keeping track for quantifying your pest issue. My way is, okay, I'm gonna start doing management when I have 30, you know, I have five of whatever pests I'm looking at per square or, you know, or 20% of the squares have a pest, pre my pest present, you know, and then it also helps keep those, those insects in place. So you can look at it with your magnifying glass and figure out, okay, that's a pest, that's just a plain fruit fly, something along those lines. Um, the yellow cards tend to work with most insects, and I will say sticky cards are probably the most effective in an enclosed area, very effective in high tunnels, greenhouse settings, but they can be used in the field setting. Um, always remember they should be set at just above the canopy of whatever you're growing. If you set them up too high, um, you're not going to be able to see that pest while they're traveling, that's usually when they get caught. And you even sometimes setting them inside of what you're growing, you may not see. Whereas if it's just right at the top of the canopy of whatever you're growing, you're gonna see that movement of pests as well. So that tends to be where a lot of your insects travel is across that canopy or top layer of your plants. And now blue versus yellow. Yellow is going to pretty much catch just about anything, though there has been research been done and I wouldn't say proven, but some pretty strong research to support that if you are having a thrip issue, and that tends to be more with your onions um, or ornamentals, but in a specialty crop production, more on your onion situation, you can have them outdoors as well. Um, thrip, and we didn't talk about thrips in our pest identification, so hopefully if you're, if you're having a pest issue with your onions, it could be thrips. Um, thrips are more, uh, are more likely to be caught or attracted to a blue card versus a yellow card. Um, and then also with the blue cards, if you're really worried about um, attracting your beneficial bugs, um, you might want to use blue cards because yellow cards are going to be more likely to attract your good bugs along with your bad bugs, whereas the blue cards are going to be less attractive to your beneficial insects. So again, that's down. That's on you, um, right here. This is a really great example of that SW SWD uh, fruit fly we talked about. That's been real, a really invasive. I can never say the whole word. I apologize. That's been uh, we talked about last week. That really has been affecting like the cherry and raspberry and strawberry crops here in North Dakota and across the United States. Um, this is a trap that is typically meant for them. It's, you know, any kind of see-through vegetable container or deli container, there are holes on the top and then there's a sticky yellow card inside. And then usually people utilize uh, apple cider vinegar or something like that to attract them in that fruity kind of vinegary smell and then hopefully that will trap them. Um, I've heard both sides of success of how well this works, but it is a great way to help monitor for those SWDs and other types of fruit flies in particular. Um, and there's a lot of really good up information on how to create these as well online. And then other traps will utilize pheromones. Um, this is a really good example of a Japanese, um, the Japanese beetles. If you're living in the Fargo area and other parts of the state, the Japanese beetle is coming. I grew up in Michigan. Uh, the state of Michigan, and these guys are just the biggest pests in the world. They eat everything, crops, ornamental plants, you name it. Um, and these traps have been around forever where it gives off a pheromone that attracts the, the Japanese beetles when they come in and they, they, they crawl down. And it's not so much to monitor or scout, though you could use them that way, as an actual trap to get, 
bring down the population. Um, so traps can be used either way as a management control or as a scouting and monitoring as well. And then a camera. Um, and one of the reasons why a camera can be so important is kind of, one is to record and give you a picture to come back later to do, do some research to look up your pest. But also, um, just to let you guys know, this is from this side here on the left is right from the uh, North Dakota State University Extension um, Insect Identification. Um, and I have the link right here that you can go to. It's the, the www.ag.ndsu.edu. Um, and they have their own, um, uh, they're offering insect identification with a dedicated insect diagnostician there. And you can, and I have that, there's a number you can call for visual or, or phone. You can email that, that you know, or text that, uh, that pest to them and they will help you identify. And I believe most of this is free of charge. I believe the only time they would charge you is if you needed to take that pest in that assessment in itself, and then they would need to test it like they'd have to do a genetic test. But you can actually, if you're anywhere near Fargo, you could take that pest, you know, way to gather that pest and they can identify it. And a good way if you are sending a pest in to be identified or you're taking it in to be identified, a really easy way to, to store it, to keep it fresh, um, is take like a little, find a little vial or tube or order a little vial or tube you can get on Amazon, anything like that, and fill it with hand sanitizer. I know right now hand sanitizer is kind of a hot commodity and you don't want to waste it too much, but what we've done in the past is, you know, just fill that tube up with hand sanitizer and pop that insect in. It'll keep its color, it'll keep some of its genetics, um, and it'll be a lot easier for that, that um, pesticide diagnostician to identify it in person. But like I said, this is the information we need for here in North Dakota, um, and they're 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 bug people. They know they know their pests, so they're always a great resource for you to use. And having a camera and be able to take a sometimes as simple as just taking a photo of the issue you have or even the damage that you have, and they can identify it from there. So that's pretty been pretty neat um, service that North Dakota State University Extension is offering to our producers across the state. All right, and then back to that sweet net, and we'll watch a video, a really short video. One of the things I am kind of bummed originally this was supposed to be an in-person workshop is I would have been able to actually, you know, I was hoping to, to show you some of these um, these procedures and some of these best practices with using a sweep net, which is used to, you know, help collect insects for identification and pests and things like that. But I do have a nice video by one of the extension areas, I think Montana. Um, which state it was, but they just show kind of some good practices on using a sweet net, and we'll get to that a little bit later. And then your diagram or that plot that's going to help you kind of keep track, especially if you have a larger scale production. Um, you know, you can sometimes a really great way is putting, you know, taking your drawing of your of or setup or our diagram of your garden or your plots and putting them in like a clear plastic sleeve and then taking that dry erase marker and making notes and then taking that back once you're done in the field and then recording it later because sometimes we just don't have time to do uh do really heavy recording but it can at least help you keep track of stuff and then again your scouting sheets which we already kind of went into really important to have something with you in the field to record as you're doing your i can't stress that enough doing this recording as you're in the field get a you know clipboard or maybe you set something up on your phone you don't have to even do some way you write it but record and while while you're doing the scouting and monitoring in person because um, if you go back and wait to do it later, you're going to forget things and the, the most efficient is to keep track of this stuff while you're physically doing it. All right, so we'll keep going. So last, um, the next thing we'll talk about some different methods for scouting. Um, and before I get into methods, I just want to talk a little bit about um, setting up a scouting or a monitoring schedule. I would suggest, I mean, everyone's going to be different and everyone's schedules are different. So I totally understand. Sometimes you just don't have a lot of time to do scouting and monitoring. But I will say, if you, the more time you can devote to your scouting and monitoring uh, program, the it may end up saving you more time in the long run if you can identify those pest issues before they become a huge problem. So I would suggest probably once, I would set aside two to three times a week of when you're going to 
focus solely on scouting and monitoring. And it can be dear, and you can mix it with different types, uh, different other activities. So say you, you get on your hands and knees and you weed your garden plot twice a week. So while you're doing, once you've gone through and done your gardening and your weeding, maybe the next thing you would do set up as part of your daily or your weekly routine is to go through and do this scouting and monitoring. I mean, you should always, whenever you're in hands, you know, on your hands and knees, kind of always keep an eye out because, you know, the more you're in and down with whatever you're growing, you're going to notice things. But I will say having an actual set aside time that you will stick to, um, be it, you know, every Tuesday and every Friday evening or every, you know, and, and do that and go back and do it a little and have a set way of how you're going to scout. And we'll talk a little bit about how, what some different things you can do with the methods will help you. Now, that's when you're trying to identify an issue. Once you have a pest issue or you identify a level of pest, you might want to up that. So just so once, if I were scouting and say I scouted twice a week and on Monday, I noticed I had a potato beetle. Um, or I saw some larvae or some eggs on my eggplants. I'm not going to wait till Friday to go back to see again to see if those populations have grown or not. I'm going to go back the very next day and I'm going to really monitor that pest issue to make sure um, that it doesn't get past my threshold or what I've set to where I'm going to actually start doing something. And I'm going to start preparing in my mind or physically um, to address that pest issue if it reaches where I don't want it to, um, where I'm, will, I'm not ready to lose anything anymore. Uh, so I would definitely, uh, once you notice there is a pest or an issue, that's when you might want to be upping your visual, your observation or your scouting for that pest. And that's when those flags I talked about, any kind of little colored flag or anything like that, something you can stick in the ground to remind yourself to go back the next day or help you find where that pest is, is going to help you come back and continually to monitor once that you find that pest present. So once you have your scouting program or your method, your methods, your, your schedule set, this is what then we're going to talk now is the methods for scouting. And you can use, usually your best bet is to do a mixture on whatever works best with the production of these methods. No one method is better than the other, and they're probably the strongest when they're used together. Um, so that's your visual observation, sweep net sampling, trapping, and then also environmental monitoring. And we'll get into each one a little bit. Um, so visual observation is just that. It works is when you're using your visual, you're getting down on your hands and knees and you're visually looking for those symptoms. Um, it works well to monitor exposed feeding insects, especially such as like potato leaf hopper, Colorado potato beetle, turnip aphids, corn borer, you know, all those different things that when you're you're going to you're going to catch a lot if you're willing to take the time to really observe what's going on with your crops. Um, it can also be used to determine whether there are beneficial insects. So not only are you scouting and monitoring just for your bad insects, it might be worth your while to kind of Suck, kind of figure out the level of good bugs that you have and be and be caught up or uh, familiar with the good bugs in your garden. You know, keep track of the early beetle population and some of your, you know, uh, parasitic wasps and things like that because that might tell you you need to up the the environmental conditions so that it's more hospitable to your your good bugs. And we'll talk a bit more about that next week with some of our natural control methods. Um, but, you know, when you're observing visually, um, it can be very objective, and this is really when you should, it can change from person to person. The way I look at something or how thorough I look at something may not be as much as the next person. So if you have more than one person working with your production, it might be smart to, if you're doing this method or utilizing this method, is assigning this task to one person. Um, or if you're doing more than one person, really make sure both of you or, the, or everyone is on the same page and they're visually observing the same way and recording the same way each time. Because what your mind might for 20% affected versus their mind a 20% disadvantage or effect might be different. Um, you know, people just see or think differently. So it can be very subjective. Um, but when you're doing visual observation, we'll talk about a little bit later, is you want to make sure you're randomly select, you want to get a good, you don't have to check every plant in your garden, it's going to take way too long. Um, you want to make sure you have a system where you're randomly selecting a group of plants within your production that's a that is a great um, 
test subject of what our overall, it's a small portion of your overall production, but it gives you a good idea of what's going on. And we'll talk about that at the end when we talk about how to do your actual scouting um, and different methods of how to do your, to pick which plants and what patterns you should use when you're doing your observation. Um, but when you're doing visual, oh, sorry, that was my fault. When you're doing visual observation, some of the things you want to do also is always, like we talked about, there's different parts of the plants are affected different ways by different pests. So always look at the upper and lower leaf surfaces, look at the growing point where the stem enters the ground, and then also really check out any fruit that might be present. Um, really great tool to help you with this is that hands lens. Um, at least the 10X magnifying hand lens will help you really enlarge some of those tiny insects so that you can distinguish, distinguish I mean, you might might see a bug on your plant it doesn't mean that it's a pest. So using that magnifying glass to actually see what and identify what type of bug or insect or whatever that is, is going to help you distinguish if you have a pest present or not on um, those characteristics. Also, you know, certain fungal um, lesions have different looks to them. You might need that to distinguish. And then um, what that, you know, to help you distinguish what type of issue you're having. Is it a disease? Is it a pest? Is it, or is it, you know, is it some other type of environmental factor? And then sweep netting. Sweep netting is a really great way to get a sample of the different types of insects that are present in your production, be it good bugs or bad bugs. Um, small insects are best monitored with a sweep net um, because it's a lot, especially if you have a really large area to cover. Um, and we'll talk about when we do sampling or, or, or do you want to usually sample about 10 to 15 percent of your at least 10 15 percent of your crop but if you have a really large field especially if you're doing say you're doing half an acre of potatoes you may not want to have to check individually check 10 to 20 percent of the plants in your potato field it might just take too much time so sweep netting can be a quicker way of getting a, uh, an overall look of what type of pests are present or what type of bugs are present in your production um, from a practical standpoint, sweet netting works best on low-growing, flexible plants like carrots, peas, leafy greens. Um, so they're also available in muslin and sailcloth. Uh, if you're more delicate stuff, you probably won't be able to do sweet netting. Um, the more bruised or damp you're worried about bruising or damaging to whatever your, your production is, sweet netting may not be the best choice because you really do need to be a little, a little rough with how you, and we'll watch a video of how you do the sweeping. Um, it's actually, we'll, we'll probably watch that next. Um, so you always wanna make sure that it, it may not work for all of your different crops. Um, Cause again, you're gonna look for things that are a bit more lighter. Uh, and then depending on what type of the crops, depends on what material you're using. Um, you wanna use muslin type of net for scouting vegetables that are a bit lighter or more flexible um, and will dry more quickly. Whereas some insects are easily monitored, um, you know, whereas you know your sailcloth might be a bit harder but when you're effectively using a sweep net you want to swing the net in an arc in front of you your body as you walk through the field one sweep is considered going from right to left about 80 degree arc but well, i think what we're really going to do um, is watch this really quick video it's like a minute and a half but it's a really it shows a really great example of someone sweeping uh, it's a YouTube video um, through a crop. So hopefully I can get this to work. I may have to bear with me. I may have to make sure it actually shares with you guys. So let's see how this goes. One second, you're not seeing it. So I'm not that just, oops, sorry. Let me just stop share real quick and then I will share again. <laughs> uh, where are we? Here we go. So. Hopefully you guys see this. Let's see. Yep, you do. So we're just going to do this really quick sweep net netting technique. A sweep net is a cost effective way to monitor for the presence of a variety of insect pests. A standard nets have a diameter of 15 inches. It's important to use a standard size net each time you sweep, so you are able to compare your results to others in your field. To start, hold the net with the hook and mirrors to the ground in front of you. Swing the net from side to side in a full 180 degree arc. 
Sweep one straw per step as you casually walk through the field or down the road. After 10 to 15 strokes, shake all your contents to the end of the net. Close the mouth of your net. Have a ziplock bag ready to go. Push inside out all the contents inside the ziplock bag. Close the bag. And now you're ready to start pinning and labeling your collection. So that's just a really, hopefully it played well for you guys. I apologize if it didn't. Um, but you can always uh, YouTube or Google other, there's a lot of other videos out there how to properly use an a insect sweep net. But that, it's pretty much that simple. It's just doing that sweeping motion as you're walking through until you find that pest um, that you're having, you know, that pest issue that you're having. So. Uh, let's make sure I get back onto what we're supposed to be seeing. All right, nope, you guys are seeing the wrong thing now. Sorry, one sec. <laughs> All right, one sec. There we go. One second, now I'm gonna share. There we go. Let's get back to where we were at. <laughs> Sorry about that, you guys. Um, there you go. Oh, no, right there. Okay. Oh, let's just do it this way. So we're getting close. Um, and so once you're done sweep netting, um, another way to do uh, to do your observation would be trapping. Um, so there, we talked about the yellow cards. They're a great way to get an idea of what type of pests you have present and to keep track and monitor for pests, especially if you're not, you know, if they're, and you can be utilizing it as well with your visual observation. There's also types on the very far left here. This is a pheromone sticky trap um, as a way. And then there's also another type of trapping and it's called black light trapping. Um, you don't see it a ton being used in specialty crops because the, the store-bought ones are quite expensive and smaller scale, but I have seen ones very similar like this guy right here on the far right, homemade. And what a black light trap will do is it, it's effective for night flying insects, such as like your European corn borer, cutworms, arnie worms, soft borers, loopers, all those things that are really active at night, which sometimes, you know, that's one of the issues is when you're looking for those type of pests that where the actual insect is active in the evenings or at night, you're gonna be looking more for the damage than the actual pest, but maybe you wanna to try to identify the pest as well. This is just like, you know, that's a bug zapper, you know, the, those nighttime bugs, they're attracted to that bright light, they get zapped and then they fall down into that tub. Um, and that might be something you wanna utilize depending on what your production is and your capabilities. It's, it's something that can be used uh, in, in the trapping and part of your scouting regime as, in monitoring uh, practices. And then um, environmental, last but not least, environmental monitoring. Um, environmental or weather monitoring can help you predict um, insect pest outbreaks and determine when disease outbreaks are likely to occur due to wet and humid conditions. Remember we talked about a lot of different pests out there and diseases out there tend to spread more in humid, wet, hot conditions. So say you, you've had, you know, blot, uh, early blight. Um, on your potatoes in the past, and we know early bright really likes humid, hot weather. So if you're keeping track, or you know um, of the your present weather, or you know what's coming up, you're gonna have a few hot, humid days coming up, or in the past, the certain times of the year tend to be more hot or humid than others, those are the times when you would be looking, really avidly looking for that particular disease or pest. Um, and a really great way to look at that, um, also maximum and minimums as well. We'll talk about some of our pests, um, Identification like potato beetles, we talked about, they don't really get active until you have at least a few days of um, where your minimum temp, you know, your minimum temperature during the day is 70 degrees. So having a minimum and maximum temperature gauge and certain insects don't become active till, you know, at, a, you know, the day temperatures and night temperatures average tend to be at a certain point. So having like a minimum and maximum thermometer of knowing what your minimum, your high and low temps are can help you monitor what type of pest issues you might be having. Um, and then also another really great resource is uh, is Endon. So if you're in North Dakota or one of the outlying counties in North Dakota, um, Endon is a weather monitoring um, 
what a weather monitoring a website a free uh, that's done or a website or I guess it's through North Dakota State University uh, platform there's um, if you you might be familiar with what your stations are but you'll see here on this map you can go to the website which is uh, up here endon.ndsu.nodac.edu or just google endon you should be able to find the link and they literally have all these different um, weather recording sites. They keep track of rain, they keep track of temperatures, and then some of these go back 20 years. So another thing you can utilize this for is your, you know, your frost dates even. You can go back and check each year or say, um, you know, you've noticed in the past you don't have flea beetle issues until the average temperature has been 80 degrees for so many days. Uh, during your, your summer. And so you can go back and use websites like this and, and um, information sources like this where say you're somewhere near Turtle Lake and you can figure out which one of these stations is the closest to your location and you can look at you know up to you know the last couple of months information you can look at last years and you know records of degrees and things like that and temperature and rainfall all the way up to you know 10 years ago so it's a great tool to utilize in just your whole production practices as well. So those are kind of those monitoring methods. And I, like I said before, um, when you're doing a scouting or monitoring um, practices, it's really best to use a, a, a few of them, if not all of them in your, in your, um, your methods. And it really, and again, it comes down from producer, comes down to producer, producer and your own time availability and things like that. But you're gonna be the most efficient in monitoring and scouting for your pests if the, the, more, the, the more diverse you are in the methods that you're using. Um, so going back to that visual observation or scouting patterns, and this can be done with visual and with sweep netting, and even with your sticky cards and things like that. These are just some really, is you, when we talked about consistent and systematic scouting, and that's the idea that you're using, you're not just randomly picking something here or there, because when we're left on our own devices as human beings, we're not really random. We tend to do we tend to do things a certain way. You might you know I, you you might veer more to the left. She you know the other person monitoring might veer more to the right, and you actually end up only looking at a small portion or a very misrepresented portion of your um, of your crop, and that's going to make issues when you're trying to. Uh, establish your thresholds because say okay my thresholds at 40% of you know my pest issue or my pest problem gets to 40% well if you're not doing a systematic way of scouting and when you think it's 40% it could actually be 60% because you're not being efficient in your scouting patterns um, but several scouting patterns um, to examine that your field or your plot or your garden systematically are really useful in understanding the condition of the field um, you know, and so these are some really two, three, two, three really great examples. You have your transect, your zigzag, and your diamond. And your best bet, depending, you know, from crop to crop, is to choose one of these patterns and stick with it. Um, uh, and going the opposite direction. So if you choose to do a transect, um, the first, you know, the simple is, which is the simplest, is walking at a somewhat straight line from one point to another and looking at the plants along the way. Um, but the one thing to remember whenever you're doing these different scouting patterns, you don't want to do the same transect each, each time. And maybe the first week you do a transect from right to left, the next week you do a transect from left to right, and then you switch it up a little bit just to make sure you're, you know, you're not missing something on the edges. Another uh, way is the zigzag pattern or the W pattern. Um, and that's going, you know, walking, making a W or a zigzag out of your field and, you know, checking plants as you go. So maybe that first week you're going from right to left, right to left, right to left. And then the next week you're going left to right, left to right, left to right. Um, and then you have the diamond pattern, which takes you to different quadrants of the field. And the diamond pattern will allow you to enter and leave the field at the same place, which is sometimes useful um, for access to vehicles or equipment or whatever you're using. Um, but the point is going through a field and looking for problems or anomalies, especially plants showing signs of stress, um, is to see that there are areas that are different. Also to be sure that your scouting pattern covers those areas which looked private problematic during your your um your at your larger scale look. So say remember we talked about the first is the big picture, look at the whole area as a like you know that whole garden or plot or a row as a whole. Um, and then from there, 
uh, make sure, and if you do see those issues, make sure that the spots you saw are part of your scouting pattern. Um, but the reason why you don't want to just pick random plants here or there is you might miss certain quadrants or issues where if you pick one of these, a, a transept, and I know with some vegetable crop producers, you might only have one row, and you should do this for each crop as well. Sorry, that was another thing is you should pick a scouting pattern for each crop you're doing. But if say you only have two rows of lettuce, then that's pretty easy, or you only have one row of eggplant, then it might be as simple as doing a transect and checking every other plant or every two plants. Um, just try to be consistent with whatever pattern you try to utilize. Um, consistent in the way that you're, it's, it's every other two, but then the next week you do the other every other two, just so that you're still getting a really good idea of what's going on with your, and getting a good idea of what's going on. So this is another great example. Um, the scouting pattern you're following and expands the, sam um, the sampling system, uh, systematically examining. When you're doing the scouting pattern, make sure you're examining those individual plants to get the true picture. And you want to make sure you're trying whatever pattern you use, that you're looking at about 10 to 20 percent of the crop. Um, so, you know, walk that transect through the field and stop at every X number steps and look for, you know, look at the three or two or five plants in that area or the one plant in that area. And then the more samples, the better precision um, when you're scouting. But that's going to come down to how much time and energy you have. You know, you might only have enough time to check every four or five plants. That's better than not checking at all. Um, but the more samples that you have, the more um, efficient you're going to be in identifying those pet symptoms early. Uh, so yeah, those are just some really great examples. So you have that transect, so every time you stop, you would look at two plants, whereas the zigzag or the diamond, you could check every one plant every time you stop after two steps, every three steps, something along those lines. Just set those parameters for yourself or whoever's scouting and go from there. All right, um, I know we're right o'clock, we're at one o'clock, so we're a little bit uh, slow here, but just remember um, sampling patterns should be modified on account of variation in your field. Um, you know, be sure depending on the size and the shape of whatever you're doing. Um, random problems usually mean um, there's some insect issues, so you can probably do a few steps, uh, fewer stops, more plants assessed at each stop. Um, but whereas if you have an aggregated issue where there, uh, you want to do more stops, um, some are in and out of the problem de um, depending, and then fewer plants are assessed at each stop that way as well. Um, whereas the random, you want to do more plants uh, when you're looking at that. Just some, some thoughts when you're, or some tips when you're looking at and doing those scouting patterns. All right, are there any questions? So there is this really great video and we don't have time to watch it. It's uh, Integrated Pest Management Scouting a Vegetable Crop by Penn State Extension. You can find it on YouTube or follow. Um, you can uh, follow this link. Oh, I don't know if they'll follow it, but you can Google. I guess you'd be able to Google it. But they kind of go through everything we've talked about and shows a visual of doing that visual of, um, inspection or the sweeping or the traps or things like that that you can utilize. Um, so are there any questions today? Okay, awesome. Thank you. I know so we've lost a few people. Uh, I probably should be going over again. I actually thought I would have uh, not enough. I thought I would have too much time left over today. Uh, but again, please join us next week and we'll actually talk about the integrated pest management practices, especially the ones that we worked on during our um, some of our research we did over the last two years. And they're going to be really kind of corresponding with those pests that we went over yes, uh, last week with. Uh, and so, yeah, thank you again for joining me today, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye, guys.